Science is all about understanding the world and the universe around you and particle physics is that part of science that tries to understand just the basic building blocks that make up the universe. And that's a very exciting place to be working. The LAC is a huge um, collider. It's the most powerful machine on Earth, the most precise machine on Earth. It's 27 kilometers long, 100 meters under the mountains, which in itself is mad. It shoots protons around at damn near the speed of light. We then collide many billions of them into each other. Protons are um, very small particles. They, they contain the most elementary particles. And not, what we're really doing is colliding those elementary particles within the protons. It has four interacting points. That means that there are four places where the two beams cross and you have the interaction and you have the events. At these four places, there are four experiments. And we are, here we are above point one, where the Atlas experiment is. So each experiment in turn is slightly different. You've got Alice, which is uh, it's a beautiful experiment, a massive steel yoke. And the most exciting part for me is a one meter wide hole they drilled in it. Uh, CMS is easily the most beautiful. LHCB is a one-sided contraption, which is interesting to look at every time you see it. But Atlas is enormous. So this is one third of the real detector. It's 33 meter tall, which is like Notre Dame in Paris. So this is just gives you a scale of what it is. And it's even more incredible that it measures particles with a precision around micrometers. The Atlas experiment is built in layers around the interaction point where the protons smash into each other. We start off with the interaction point, which is inside a vacuum pipe that is part of the accelerator, which is somewhere around that size. The interaction point itself is 10 micrometers in diameter. From there, we get collisions. Particles come out in a sort of tree where they decay into other particles as they become more and more stable. And the first of these happen within the first few millimeters, so we can't actually see them. They're still in the beam pipe in the vacuum. Uh, and then around that, our first detector layer is currently at 33 millimeters radius. And the first few layers are made out of silicon and they're a bit like uh, inside your camera phone. They're like little cameras, except for they take 40 million pictures a second. Every time a, a particle, a charged particle, passes through uh, these silicon layers, it leaves a tiny charge deposit, which we can amplify up and digitize and then see in our computers. So we get a little dot that says that something was there. Uh, and then by joining up those dots through a succession of layers, we can reconstruct the tracks of where the particles have moved. We then stop the majority of those particles in things called calorimeters, which measure the energy of them. And we do that in the classic way that you stop anything by putting lots of mass in front of it. So our calorimeters are built from iron, tungsten, copper, anything that's heavy, basically. And you end up somewhere around a few thousand tons. So they, they get smashed into the calorimeters, they, they get uh, absorbed there, their energy is given up and we can work out how much energy they have. So then we can see the trajectory, the energy, we can measure their momentum from how much they bend in the big magnetic field that we've got inside the detector. And so from that we can work out a lot about what that particle was, where it came from, um, and how it interacts. These uh, collisions, they're very, very complex. Um, lots of data goes through the detector, at uh, very, very high rates. And the only way we can actually process those, that data is via computers. We get 40 million uh, proton-proton collisions every uh, second, and we can only record to disk about a thousand of them. So we're throwing away 99.9% .9 of our data, but we have to make sure it's the right 99.9% .9 we're keeping the right uh, small amount of data. So we have uh, farms of computers which do this. Uh, we run complex algorithms to look at the data, determine if there are things that look interesting to us, so particular particles or signals in the detector that would indicate that there was an interesting event happening, and then those are the events we keep. So we're in a clean room. What I'm wearing now is not to protect myself, although it might look like that, it's to protect the work that we're, we're doing. Um, everything is sort of designed so that dust falls off you. And as you can see, I'm wearing a beard net and a hair net. We don't want any hair getting into our work as well, because um, that could ruin it. My job is looking into and developing new technologies for interconnect um, technology. Effectively, we start with a bunch of different components. 
Uh, the first part would be a sensor material, second part would be an ASIC, which is an action-specific integrated circuit. It basically takes um, signals that are passing through the detector, the sensor material, and converts that into something that we can read. Um, it's a bit like you've got in your, in your digital camera, you've got sensor that receives the light, but then you want an image on a, on a micro SD card or something. And so there's electronics in between that you need to have that turn the image on the sensor into something that you can then look at on the computer. That all gets read out by something called a PCB, which is the green stuff that you might see if you take apart your phone. Um, we, what we do here is we assemble that all together and create the signals and the, uh, the currents and the electrical um, things that you need to make a fully functioning detector. That stuff all needs to be supported, you can't just hang it mid-air, and you typically need to cool it. So there's a lot involved with making things stable, lots of carbon fibre that gets put in because it's very light, it conducts heat, it doesn't move, such things, and lots of glue. The scale is off the charts, I don't think you can really appreciate until you actually come here and you meet all the people that have worked on the civil engineering side, the engineering side, the computing side, and then for me, for people like me to actually get our hands on the data, the amount of work that I had to go into every little bit and all the planning that it took is really, it blows my mind. The Iris Atlas project is we're working on training secondary school students to work with real Atlas data to answer their own real physics question. Um, this data we um, provide in a slightly curated form. And we also provide um, a series of exercises um, for them to get started um, and stuck in this data. At first it's sort of learning how to code in Python and getting the basics and building the basics up. And then uh, we'll sort of guide you through a real search for particles at, in the data from Atlas. We've designed a program where a student could never have come across anything particle physics before, any sort of computer programming before, and they can go in at like completely fresh, you know, as long as there's sort of enthusiasm and questions there. Um, and we'll train them in the real techniques that we use to analyze all of this data to be able to, you know, make real physics measurements and hopefully be able to branch out on their own and start answering their own questions. Python is a computer programming language uh, that's uh, it's all open source, so anyone can access it, anyone can download it on their computer, they don't need to sort of pay for anything. Um, and it's a really versatile uh, computer software for uh, any, you know, it's used across science and, you know, people at home and, you know, making anything from making animations to doing uh, analysis of data. What role does code in fame, I work? <laughs> it's essentially part and parcel of my everyday life. Um, everything is coding from gathering the detector outputs to then analysing them, to presenting them, visualising the results. Um, so coding plays a massive part of my job. Um, it would be virtually impossible to do what I do without coding. I do it every day. Um, I use a couple of different languages. I think three now <laughs> that I use kind of interchangeably. Um, I think we've got C++, Python, and then CTRL. Um, and yeah, I use them every day. It, it really permeates everything. Because I mean, like, when you're looking at data, if you have like a million events, you can't just like, you know, look at everyone and say, okay, is this, is this, uh, what does this look like? What, and like calculate uh, in an Excel sheet. You can't do that for every single event for like millions of events. I love that you can take something really complicated, like trying to work out the asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the universe and basically reduce it all down into a list or a set of instructions for the kind of computer to do on some data and then you can get a number out and you can really do some really precise measurements. There's always these problems that come up and there's always like these interesting things like where you don't understand why something is the case and you have to kind of design ways of probing that and I think that's one of the most interesting ways that you can um, they're one of the most interesting parts of, of, of research. I, you know, I learned coding in school before I think it was more widespread and I'm so incredibly grateful to have got to do that. I feel like even if I hadn't gone into physics, it would have been like a really important life skill to have. So most basically the idea is for the students to have fun and to do whatever they like with this data that's provided um, um, while also learning, learning to code, which is, as we've discussed, a very important part of particle physics. Um, in my wildest dream, 
we might see students um, engaging in their own original research, um, based on which they might even find something we haven't found as um, researchers here at CERN, um, ACT Matter, for example. There could be all sorts of exciting things uh, hidden within this data. You know, we're, we're looking very hard to try and understand the difference between matter and antimatter, or to try and understand the properties of the top quark or the Higgs boson maybe even to try and work out what the dark matter is made out of. Now, the school students could contribute to any of those questions, but they might think of something more interesting themselves, and their more interesting question could end up being more interesting than any of us, uh, if you like, professional researchers have thought of up until now. I think it's a great opportunity and you should definitely try it out because you're not only going to be learning kind of skills like coding, but you're also going to learn a lot of problem solving, and more than that, you're going to learn how to identify problems, which is not something that you're taught in a physics classroom. Like you're just given, this is the problem, this is how you solve it, now do an exam. <laughs> That's not what physics is like. This can be, I find some of the questions that students ask, they say, okay, why am I doing this maths? Why am I doing this physics? Why is it useful? And this is a really good case of the significance and what you can do with the maths and physics, you can combine them together, the maths, the physics, but also just the understanding and the application. I think it's, uh, especially for these scientific subjects, there is a huge difference between how they are taught in school and uh, what is everyday life. For me, I did struggle with a lot of the curriculum and it wasn't something that necessarily connected with me. But once I started doing some things outside of it, I realised how much I actually loved physics and how much more there was than the curriculum. I wish I had the opportunity to do something like this when I was in school because just the hands-on working on some actual, you know, with actual data, with actual research, the sort of thing that is actually done is so much more interesting than reading about how it's done in a book, right? You know, when new questions come along, it's not usually because someone who's old and long in the tooth has uh, thought of a new question. Very usually, or very often, it's because someone new has come to the game and thought of a new and interesting question. And that's exactly what we want the school students to do, is to think of their own exciting questions as to what they would like to look for in the data from the Atlas experiment.